Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show. One of the hardest things ever is to understand how PPOs really work. We've spent a lifetime studying them. We're still studying them. And there's stuff that's just way beyond us. That's why I keep bringing back experts like Shelly DeGroff. Today's episode, she talks about the 2024 trends. You have to know as a dentist about what's going on in PPOs. It's awesome. Please listen to this. I hope you guys enjoy it. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam around here. Our job is to find the best experts, teachers, thinkers in all of dentistry to help you create a better practice, a better life. Today, we're going to be talking about PPOs, the trends that are happening in 2024 and what you need to know about PPOs with our good friend, Shelly DeGroff from PPO Advisors. Thanks for being on again, Shelly. I appreciate you. Thanks for having us back. We love being a part of your show. Yeah. So this is going to be a hot topic. I love having you on. Like I said before, we hit the go button. We're going to cover a lot today, but I want people, first of all, let's start here. I want people to know who they're listening to. So give us a little bio. Who are you? What do you do, Shelly? <laughs> so PPO Advisors is a negotiating contracting company that focuses on getting providers the best reimbursements they can get, but also educating providers on how to play the insurance game, helping those office managers understand the ins and outs of those contracts, the webs, the uh, the tricks, everything that comes with insurance. We want to be that, that resource to help them find success. So all PPO Advisors does is advocate, educate, and help find providers the best we can. Yeah. I think you have a very unique job. Like this is a very dynamic space that you're a part of. And um, you also do a lot of learning with some other friends that we have uh, that do the same thing. And let's start here. Um, give us the big picture. Like what do I need to know if I'm a dentist listening about 2024? Where do we start? Absolutely. It's 2024 is going to look similar to 2023. I do think we are going to continue to see a higher trend of providers wanting to term out of insurance contracts. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them wanting to, to look into that. I'm never going to be an advocate of you have to be a PPO practice because let's be real, that is very difficult to be just strictly PPO. There has to be a healthy balance of your fee for service to PPO ratio but we see the trend rising. What used to be a much lower number of fee-for-service rates, or I'm sorry, fee-for-service practices, we are now seeing that number increase to where we're about 16% now fee-for-service. Um, and that number just three years ago was 6% from the ADA. So we're seeing that, that rise and, and, and I wanna see it rise even more because I do feel like as these providers realize that they can stay busy. They can have success being out of network with some of these insurances that just aren't serving their practice well. More and more providers will get confident with that. And that's only going to force a hand with the insurance companies to maybe evaluate why providers are no longer wanting to be in network. Yeah. So that's a really important statistic. And again, like I love the data and you and I talked about this before we hit the go button. I'm um, I'm always careful to tell people like, oh, you got to get away from PPOs. I think you need the right mix for whoever you mm -hmm. are. And I think there are so many people out there that are like, well, fee for service is dead. It is not dead by evidence of this statistic. Now, our anecdotal, again, we work with about 100 practices intimately, but I'll tell you from our small sample a lot of people used COVID as the perfect example of, I don't want to do this anymore. And then even post-COVID, they're like, I'm doing the math. I don't want to do this anymore. 
and not one of them, and I'm not saying this if you're listening that you have to be fee-for-service. Please don't hear that. But I don't have one of our practice, not one, who got off of it and said, I miss PPOs. Have you found the same thing? <laughs> I have found the same thing. Yeah. No, no one comes back saying, I really regret that decision. Right. Um, now, maybe those that are jumping ship all at once, they might have a little period of, wow, that was great for a couple months. And then that six month cycle comes back when you know you have your recall patients and, and you may feel like you're losing more than what you anticipated in that six month cycle. But no, they're not regretting that decision for the most part. And, and it's a decision that needs to be evaluated. It really does. So, and I'm not, I'm not bashing any of these insurance companies saying, you know, oh, we need to all drop insurance. That's not the case either. Right. It's we have to look at our practices and be able to evaluate what is working, what is not working, and find success within both of those areas, fee-for-service and PPO. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other statistic, too, that's important if you're listening to this is the percentage of write-offs. Can we just add that before we go into the trends and why this is so important to understand that as a dentist? So what what trends are you seeing with write-off percentages now? So... We stick with the percentage of right around 40 to 43 percent on average is what that write off tends to be in our practice. Right. In, in our realm of all the providers we look at, we typically see about on average 43 percent. Um, it is not uncommon for us to find providers that have write offs over 55 percent, um, 60 percent in some cases. And they're shocked to see those numbers. And it's shocking to us that they didn't realize what those numbers were. So in 2024, you know, we want to continue to educate providers that not knowing what your write-off level is, is more dangerous than attempting to do something about it. Let's not stick our head in the sands. Let's actually know what numbers are impacting our practice. Are we really seeing 50% write-offs in our practice? And if we are, conversations need to be had. Right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, 43% is the number I like to throw out there. That's about the average write off across the nation, um, but not unheard of to see them significantly higher. That means you're working one out of every two days for free. Like you're just going to work, right? Yes. Yes. So, on average, when you have a 40% write off, you need to see three insurance patients to one fee for service patient. So you're working that much harder to keep that rate going. That's wild. Okay. You're blowing my brain up here. I have so yeah. many questions and I, you know, we got to, we got to stay on the rails here. We'll talk about trends. Um, let's go into the trends. Like one of the things that you shared with me is that PPOs work on fiscal years, not calendar years. And why is that important for us to understand in dentistry? Yeah. Absolutely. So all insurance companies obviously run on different calendars, but for the most part, we see that fee increases will come out at the beginning of January. So uh, if you guys have not logged on to your portals to look for a fee increase with your certain insurance companies that you hold contracts with, you should. Um, I know for a fact, Premier, Zealous, they already uploaded their fee increases to the portal. Almost everybody is getting an increase from those two umbrella companies, which is great. Um, some are seeing bigger increases than others, but they weren't negotiated increases. Those are just inflation increases. Um, the other ones you tend to have to ask for. Um, some are going to give them at the beginning of the year, but then others tend to wait until G uh, July or August, and that is because they've kind of reset their calendar year at that point. Um, one of the big things we see though, uh, providers are always asking, you know, what are the stipulations of the contract this year? Is there anything we need to be aware of? And a lot of those changes don't come out until after July. So what we typically don't see is any major contract changes right now. We're gonna see those come March, April, May, June, July. Um, as they prepare for their new calendar year. Yeah, it's very interesting. And then you also share with me, you do a lot of work with dentists and say office managers, and there's trends that you see, like some fees are going up and some yes. aren't. Can you talk about that? Well, I think there's a, a huge wave of 
practices reaching out on their own to try to increase their own rates, which I'm ecstatic about. I'm hoping that the education we're throwing out there is motivating all these offices to reach out to their insurance companies and ask for free increases. That's what we want to see. And we are finding as we're working with practices, they're like, you know, we reached out to said network and we got a fee increase. We accepted it because we were so excited to see, you know, our profi code went up by five dollars. But when we actually ran that full fee schedule against their production with that network, so we look at all the codes they submit over the course of 12 months with each individual network, it was a decrease of about 7%. So what they thought was going to be a great increase for their practice overall was a decrease in fees by accepting that fee schedule. And so these insurance companies are like, well, yeah, let's trick them. Let's throw some really good numbers in on some of the really important codes, which, you know, are our preventative codes, right? But we also do a lot of production on our basics and some of our majors, crowns and so forth. When you overall lump that together, that can be a big decrease for the practice. So don't get tricked by insurance. Make sure you're looking at the overall picture, what you produce, what codes you're utilizing most frequently. Again, 10 codes bring in 90% of your production. So take a look at those 10 codes and really evaluate, does this fee schedule fulfill the goal we're after before you accept that fee? Yeah. And can I just ask you about that? Because this is the stuff I, I just love. I totally geek out on this. You know, sometimes you just have to make the complicated or the complex as simple as possible. Every business has a fee for a service and then it's how many times they do the service. So think of it in terms of that. A lot of times we get caught up on, well, I have this many patients and that many patients. Am I thinking about this the right way? Like it's a fee that you get for a service and the number of times you do the service, correct? Exactly. Exactly. So when these offices are, you know, hyper focused on their implant fee, but then you look at the production over 12 months with that insurance company, you may have only actually placed two implants with that said company. So yeah, implants are important to your practice over all patients, over all insurances, fee for service, over the entire practice. But that doesn't mean you need to hyper focus on that one code to ensure that, you know, accepting a fee schedule is based off of that one, right? So 10 codes bring in 90% of that production. So that is usually going to be your preventative, your fillings, typically crowns for general practice. And then as you look at your specialties, you know, endo, perio, really you're looking at five codes that bring in most of that, that production. So really focusing on that and understanding how each of those codes impacts your practice is where you're going to find your success in the fees. Yeah. And now let's, there's so much I want to cover. You talk about master fees being evaluated. I love that phrase that you use. Can you tell us what that means? What does that mean? Yes. So your master fee schedule is your UCR, your fee that you submit on every claim form and every fee for service patient gets. So you have to, legally have a master fee schedule, meaning all patients, whether they're fee for service or insurance based, you charge the same amount. It is considered fraudulent to have multiple fee schedules, meaning you charge your insurance patients more than you do your fee for service patients, right? So you have to have a system within your practice to make that legal. Um, so your master fee schedule should be billed out on your claims. Make sure you're always billing out your full UCR and not putting the PPO fee on your claim because you're undercutting yourself if that's the case. Insurance companies are always looking at the data on the claims. So if your fee represents the PPO fee, they have no reason to increase their fee for your demographic. So always put your master fee on the claim. But as practices, we need to help each other. And by keeping our master fees in line with what the demographic supports, which should be somewhere between that 70th and 80th percentile, we tend to push you a little closer to that 80th if we can. If all practices did that, then the insurance companies are forced to kind of play that same role. They have to be within a certain range, right? So it is very important at the beginning of the year or whenever you increase your fees 
to do that on a yearly basis, the ADA recommends anywhere from a three to 5% increase. Now that doesn't mean you have to increase every code by 5%. You can increase your top 10 codes, you know, back to 10 codes for general practice, bring in 90%, maybe focus on those and then the rest see a two or a 3% increase. Or if you're already high on certain fees and you wanna leave those, okay, but make sure you're doing some sort of increase every year to your fees to help the whole dentistry community with insurance keeping fees at a higher rate. Yeah. And it, you know, our experience has been, and if you're listening to this, please hear this. It's amazing to me how many well-meaning offices don't present their master fee schedule. They're presenting something else. Now you may be on PPOs right now, and your thought may be, oh, I don't want to be in the future. You still need to present your full fee so that when you get off of some of them, people have been used to seeing that. And your team members have been used to presenting the full fee all the time in that respect. Um, and that is huge. Now, the other thing, can I just throw some stuff at you? Because I have these conversations every day and we're not insurance experts. That's not, you are, you are, you know, you know how all of this works. Sometimes with these third-party administrators, umbrellas, TPA, there's so many names for them now. Dentists don't know. I get, I get this all the time. Well, I only participate with one and we use Dental Intel's payer will. And you can see that they're involved with 27 of them and yeah. they don't even know that. And so is the only way to really know if you're involved in umbrellas to audit EOBs regularly still or no? It is. That is the best way to audit your insurance participation is through the EOBs. Um, okay, so we're going to back up just a little bit here. You have to envision a web, right? So an office, when they tell you that we only signed up with one or we only signed up with two, all networks are interconnected. So the days of I signed up with an insurance company means I only got that insurance company, that's gone. All networks have a backdoor agreement to another network. So when you sign up, not even with just a TPA or an umbrella company, it can be a shared network. So I'm gonna use Guardian as an example. Guardian, you can be in a direct contract with them. So you would think I'm a network with just Guardian, but that agreement shares to over 30 some other agreements. And then those agreements can share. And so you then have opened your practice up to being in network with hundreds of potential payers. So there's so much more that goes into signing a contract, signing an agreement in what you actually participate in. And so when you audit EOBs, because I'm sure people are listening saying, well, I know I'm in network with Guardian directly. Why do I need to audit that EOB? the most favored nations clause comes into play. And I talk about this a lot um, because most practices don't know about it and that's okay. There's too much to know out there. So I don't want anyone to feel like, well, gosh, I should have known this, but this is a big deal. The most favored nations clause allows the networks to find the lowest fee schedule they can attach to within a practice through those backdoor agreements. So even though you signed on with a contract with say Guardian, at a fee you thought was respectable at the time, it may actually be paying off of a different fee schedule and the EOB is going to reflect that. So if that EOB doesn't say paid off of Guardian's preferred network, instead it says paid off of a different network, then you know you're not utilizing the fee that you thought you had secured for that contract. And that's where most practices don't realize they're losing money is through the shared agreements, the backdoor agreements, and that most favored nation clause coming into play. Okay. So we need a whole another podcast on just that one alone. And <laughs> let's wrap that piece up in a, a nice little bow. When you're talking about auditing EOBs, like 10 a week, I mean, not all of them, but what do you say no, to office you, managers? I would definitely have your core networks looked at once a week. So as your input payments, right? And you're looking at those, make sure that you're, you know, our big players that, yep, that's still saying the same fee schedule I agreed to. And if you see something different, it's a red flag immediately. And then you're going to want to go back 
an audit last week's and the week before if you didn't get a chance to do it, because most likely it's been happening for longer than you think. And most of the time when you contact these insurance companies and say, hey, I noticed we're being paid off of a different fee, they're probably not going to backdate and say, well, we'll change the fee to this. Now, in some cases they will, because you may have had an opt out or a block in place preventing that to happen and they just overrode it in their system. Um, but most of the time practices aren't even aware this can happen. So they didn't put the proper paperwork in play. So you want to catch it as soon as you can. Now, again, if that proper paperwork was in place, then you can get those networks to backdate and update that fee to reflect the higher reimbursement, which is what you want to have happen. Very cool. Very cool. All right, let's go to creden credentialing. You know, this is something that you've, you know, brought up before, but it's something that you can't stop talking about. It's crazy important that credentialing is done the right way. Can you tell us why? It's critical. So if you're not credentialing correctly, you are allowing the insurance companies to set your rate, right? You're allowing them to come in and do whatever they want to do to your practice because you're not regulating them. Um, so back to what I said, you know, back in the 90s, we could say, I want to be a network with one insurance company. And that was the insurance company got at the fee they gave us. But that's not the case. So that web of insurance has now grown so much that if you are not well versed in the contracts you are signing and understanding how one contract will impact another, you really are setting your practice up for failure. Negotiations how you can successfully successfully negotiate relies on how your contracts are set up. So there are contracts that will fight each other. So there are certain ones that you just don't want to have, you know, one insurance company and another both direct because now you're fighting against those two insurance companies and it makes getting an increase nearly impossible. So the whole point of successfully contracting is to maintain successful negotiations and increases for your practice long term. So when we talk to acquisitions or startup practices that are like, you know, I need to get a network in the next 30 days, what's the fastest way to do it? That's really what the insurance companies want you to say, because then they know the fastest way to get into network is through that direct contract, sometimes at the lowest rate because you don't have time to negotiate it or figure out the best way to be in contract with them. You have set your practice up for failure long term by going that direction. Wow. That's a lot to consider. And that's why you need help of an expert. So we're going to leave Shelly's information down in the in the show notes. And I'm going to highly encourage you, don't try to figure this stuff out by yourself. That's why we have her on the podcast and many friends like this. There's such a great community out there. Um, what are some other trends we need to know in 2024? So big trends that we're anticipating. Um, we are seeing several of the TPAs have increases this year, which is great. Last year in 2023, some of those bigger TPAs were on a freeze, meaning there were no increases available. So what does that mean for a practice? When uh, TPAs open up negotiations, it does allow for different stacking of contracts, different options available that you can play uh, within your practice. You're going to hear me say the word play a lot. This is a game. Insurance, negotiations, contracting has become a game and you have to be well versed in it in order to be able to to play it successfully against your component so with that i hate i hate to say that it's a game but it, it really is and, and it's one that we have to take pretty serious um, some other trends we're seeing um, network shares so that web that we talk about which is oh so important can change at any given point in time so the the trend that happened in 2020 got a little bigger in 2023 and I anticipate to see just as large in 2024 is networks that have shared will stop their share or will stop sharing with certain TPAs or, or certain shared networks, meaning you're either grandfathered in or now that change can't happen that you may have been anticipating taking place. All things that we are well versed in that we can help navigate, but just because of payer shows up 
on a payer through a does not mean that that payer is actually available through that contract at this given point in time. So they don't always take them off the payer list because there's a freeze on that one shared network for maybe six months and then they'll open it back up. So it can be very deceiving. I don't feel like that's ethical um, because a lot of practices are trying to navigate this on their own and it is very deceiving to see that a payer shows up on a list that we can be in network with it and then come to find out well, they're not accepting that payer at this time. So um, we can't expect offices to know this stuff on their own. There's there's no website to go to or encyclopedia to pull and it's gonna give you all the facts about each payer, how it's shared and when it's going to be shared. That's information we learn through talking to the networks on a daily basis. So that's why we promote the education, reach out to any, you know, expert that you can find and just ask questions. And if they're not willing to educate you, then they're probably not the ones you should be talking about. But I feel education should be free and that if you have a question, it should be answered. And, and we want you guys to know as much about all of this web and confusion as we do. So as a community, we're all more powerful. That's only yeah. going to help. Amen. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> echo that sentiment any better than you did. That's so great. And the other thing that becomes a challenge with this data or even knowing any of this, it's hard to get this stuff out of your computer. We have a lot of people that are experts on Dentrix, EagleSoft, Open Dental. It takes them forever to compile all the data that we need to analyze this. And I don't want to create a conspiracy theory here, or maybe I do. I don't know. It's not easy. And so I don't think it's a good use of a dentist time or an office manager's time to sit down and compile all this. Don't you think? Not at all. I don't even know how they could. I really don't. There's just, there's so much that goes into how the networks are playing this game that I, I really want office managers to not feel that burden and, and that guilt of, well, I should have known this. You know, when I was an office manager, I felt bad when I didn't realize we were getting paid incorrectly. You know, it's like, oh man, three months went by and we were on the wrong fee schedule. I, I get that you feel that you're responsibility but this is by design what we are seeing is by design it is created so that there's chaos with insurance it's difficult it's overwhelming and you don't have the time to deal with it so don't make that your burden that is definitely something you know all entrepreneurs here what you can outsource out, you should this is one of those things. This is not something you can expect your team to be able to have all the information at their fingertips on because it's we struggle at getting the information at times. You know, and we're we're directly on the front lines with the networks and it's still a struggle to sometimes get the transparency we need from them to be able to educate practices as they need to see it. Yeah, I love it. One of the messages that sometimes messages that gets construed or a little convoluted is like what you do is very valuable for a lot of offices. And then people go, well, no, I can't get off of PPOs. I'm like, it's not about getting off of PPOs. Are, am I correct in assuming this? Sometimes it's just about switching the mix. You might be on one that's not really right. good for your future. And it might be in your best interest to transition to another one slowly. Am I, am I on the right track? You're absolutely on the right track. And being comfortable with where you sit today is not where you should maybe be comfortable sitting next year. So this is always changing. Big employer groups are always changing where their insurance is coming from, right? So we are always changing how we feel about certain networks and how those certain networks impact your practice. This is something you should be evaluating on a yearly basis and it should be as important to you this evaluation as it is you know your profit and loss on everything else so um yes to that it's sometimes more the mix are you on the right mix should you be terminating some insurances i'm all for seeing the right balance um, we often see most practices are over contracted meaning there's too much overlap Right. So all of these networks are shared together. There is no reason in most cases to have overlapping contracts. Let's simplify so that there's less fee schedules for that most favored nations clause to attach to. And let's really only focus on the ones that are going to be long term success within that practice. 
and evaluating lots of numbers is how we kind of come to the conclusion of what we need to do. And then looking at your production with each insurance company will help decide, can we drop this insurance? Should we change this insurance, get a 20% increase, keep it for another year or two, and then we'll evaluate if we're even going to keep that one in a year or two, right? So I don't think you should ever be comfortable enough to say, this is the set stone, this is in writing, and we're going to keep it this way for the next five years. That would not be looking at your practice successfully. In my opinion, this is a yearly evaluation. It's changing constantly, and you've got to be willing to change with it to see success. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, I want you to tell, talk to um, our listeners about what you do and how you do it. But before we do that, any last thoughts you have on trends for 2024? My last thoughts, my take home is 2024 is a fresh year right in front of us. Learn to play the game and play it with confidence, whether it be on your own or with an expert but know that there's always different options available. It's just a matter of understanding them and putting them into play within your practice. So there's always a change that's available. There's always an opportunity that can be had, but not making a change and not looking at what you can do is more dangerous than actually making the changes. So that's my take home for 2024. This is your year to actually make a change. I love it. And so if I'm listening and I want to make a change, Shelly, how are you going to help me? How does this work? Can I, can I reach Absolutely. out to you? How does this work? Yes, please reach out to me. Go to our website, ppoadvisors.com. We have a contact us page. You can schedule an appointment through our calendars on one of us will get to you right away. Um, we are one of the only companies that does a completely free PPO analysis, meaning there is no investment up front. And if you don't move forward with any of the, the changes that we can present to you, that is perfectly okay. We feel the education comes first. The knowledge that you take away from that analysis is what you then can put into play when you're ready. We also do our negotiations up front during our free analysis. So that means we're able to show you new fee schedules. This is an actual fee schedule that you will get. So this is your return on investment first. Now that helps us weigh the, the decision of should we or should we not stay in network with this insurance or is it time to term? Things you need to know in order to successfully make a big change in your practice. So we feel it's very important that we present all the knowledge first, then give you the opportunity to decide how best to put it into play. So we're one of the only companies that's willing to kind of work up front all on our dime in order to make sure that you have all the education, which we love. Yeah. That's awesome. Shelly, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to have you back again and again and again and give us trends every year. Actually, every January, we should do trends for 2025, 2026, 20, just because this stuff is so complex. And I love it when we can have a, an expert navigate us through these challenges. So thanks for being on, Shelly. I appreciate you. Thank you again. We love what you do. Yeah. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, can you do us a favor? Can you hit the share button? And also, I know you're not taking notes, so I'm taking notes for you. So if you're listening on Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, don't worry. Everything that we talked about, you can just flip up to the notes in the podcast, and it'll take you right to Shelly's information. You can click right there. It'll take you right to her website. You can reach out. Make sure um, you get this information so you know what you're doing, and you can enjoy a better practice and a better life. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.